education for home learning in schools, universities, and through vocational training centers. Let's go in. All right, well, we're going to get started as I guess the beginning of my <laughs> Slideshow, it should have started at the beginning. All right, so uh, before I introduce our Steno royalty guest here, who is uh, Jen, oh, I should have asked you how to pronounce your last name, Shook? Is that Shook. Okay. Um, I also want to let you all know that we have, uh, by the kindness of Jen, a, an actual live captioner here. So you can click on your captions and actually watch the live captioner um, captioning this whole interview. And her name is Tara Gentry. She's been uh, in the reporting industry since 2000 and she does captioning. She's an official now, does everything. So uh, send out a thank you shout out to, to Tara for doing this for us today. You guys are getting a live demo Yay. of what captioning looks like. <laughs> so, um, all right. So now on to our um, main uh, guest here today. She's trying to get up her uh, bio that I prepared here because uh, if I were to do her whole bio, it would probably take the whole half an hour to tell you all the stuff that she's been doing. So, um, I just want to give you a little bit short rundown of her. Uh, she started out, I believe, in the reporting industry, and she can correct me on all of this, but in the reporting industry. And uh, 10 years into it, changed to captioning. She's been a 100% advocate for uh, the captioning and reporting industry, all of us. Uh, and she's got a list of um, letters after her name. <laughs> um, and she's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm hesitating because I'm trying to bring up this uh, technology. Jen and I were talking about technology that uh, was great when it works, but um, I'm trying to get up everything I wrote about her, so I'm just kind of doing this by, by memory. So again, I said she's been an advocate for the industry, working on ethics task force. Uh, she's also a contest winner uh you can see the picture right now i believe that you're watching is uh, her most recent win in italy at the interstellar convention and <clears throat> she's also done speed contests here in the states and i'm sure she'll tell us a little bit uh, of that mm -hmm. now just before uh i asked jen to start talking <clears throat> there's a question can you see the captions on your phone yes you can um they should, per our tests that we've done yesterday, they should just pop up. But um, if anybody's not getting them, I'm not sure you can kind of fool around with your Zoom on your on your phone. So, um, all right. So here we have with us Jen. Uh, Jen, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for coming here and talking to us today. Um, I just uh, really feel like you are Steno Royalty and we are happy to have you here today. Well, those are very, very kind words, Laura. But I don't want to be in the category of Steno royalty. I'm just, I'm just like all the rest of us doing this job. Well, and, but loving every day of it. Great, that's a great. Uh, let's start out with how you even got interested in, in reporting or, or, you know, court reporting school? What led you to, to court reporting school? It wasn't necessarily a decision of mine. So when I was in high school, I took every business class that was available at the high school. And this was back in the days of WordPerfect and what they called desktop publishing. And I just, I loved keyboarding. I loved being in front of the computer. And uh, so I took every class that the school offered. And as a senior, there was really nothing left for me to take. But I was in a class and my business teacher had said, you know, you really should pay attention. We're going to have a guest speaker tomorrow. And I think it's something that you might be interested in. And I said, okay, you know, you're just a senior in high school. What I knew at that point, though, was that I wanted to be a legal secretary. 
the law interested me. I had no desire to be a lawyer, but the law interested me. And I just, I loved shuffling paper and I loved keyboarding and doing things on the computer. So I just thought a legal secretary would be a really good fit for me. So the guest speaker came and it happened to be the director of admissions for McCormick College in Chicago. And that's where I'm from, even though now I live in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I've been here for 20 years. And so I listened, you know, to their presentation and my takeaway was they had a legal secretarial program at the school, but what he was pitching, of course, was the court reporting program. And what they said was that if you registered for the court reporting program and after the first quarter, because we were on quarters, not semesters, you didn't like it or you wanted to change to the legal secretary program that I could, there would be, I would not lose any credits. It would just be an easy shift. So I really had nothing to lose. So I thought, okay, I'll give it a try. And I think I was hooked on the first day of theory, like walking in, getting that manual machine, bringing it home. I mean, we didn't even have a tripod yet. So I remember sitting on the floor going, is, is, is. Um, and obviously I never changed to the legal secretarial program. And uh, it took me two years to get through school. I went straight from high school and um, within two years, I started working. At that time, Illinois was a CSR only state, meaning that even if you passed your RPR, you still could not work. You had to pass their CSR. They had no reciprocity at that time. So I can go on with the story or I can let you lead the way, Laura. Well, let's hear, uh, obviously you went through pretty fast going by today's standards. Um, what Do you know what the name of your theory was? You know, the best I can tell you is that it was stenograph's theory. It was not stened, it was not, um, it was not any other theory, the book, was about maybe five by seven. It had a gray front, it said stenograph on it, and it had like a sheet of steno paper that went across the front of it. So I think it was stenograph's theory. I never really thought twice about what my theory was until probably 10 years later when people started asking, well, what theory do you use? Or, I don't know, it's one with the little gray book. So I think it was actually stenograph's theory they did say it was real time ready back then, 26 okay. years ago. Okay. Um, but in fairness, I was taught plenty of conflicts. So <laughs> okay. I'm not really sure that it was real time ready. I had plenty of fixing that I needed to do once I started uh, doing real time and then ultimately captioning. All right. So school ended. You're out there. You took the tests and, and passed them. What next? Um, I worked in Chicago for about four years as a court reporter before I moved to Arizona. And during my internship, I, I interned at a lot of the, obviously a lot of the firms there in Chicago, both big and small. And I thought that I knew exactly which firm I wanted to go work for when I passed the CSR. Um, just as a quick side note, I did pass my RPR when I was still in school. But like I said, I still couldn't work. So I still had to go to school. I, I passed the May exam, but I wasn't finished with school until the end of, uh, well, end of July, beginning of August. And in that time frame, end of July, I also got married. So I had a lot of things going on right at the end of court reporting school. But so when I was looking for a job after I passed the CSR, well, I wasn't looking. I knew exactly where I was going to go. And back in that day, and even still today, you can walk into a firm and pretty much get a job as long as you have your license. However, I had a firm owner reach out to the school once 
she had learned of the test results and asked if she could have my contact information because she was interested in hiring somebody and she was a very small firm. It was just her, but she had grown enough that she was ready to add um, a reporter. And so she called me and I remembered her. It was um, her and her friend. They had two court reporting firms, but they shared an office. And so the other court reporting firm probably had about four or five reporters at that time. But sh sh for her, it was, um, it was just her and she was looking to add a reporter. And, you know, I talked to her and I thought, I'm going to give it a try. This was not the firm that I had initially selected that I was going to go work at. And I will tell you, her name is Peggy. Mm -hmm. Peggy is one of my dearest friends still today. Uh, she sold her firm and she's now an official in Illinois, but um, we're going to go have coffee next week because I'm going back to Chicago. And I credit her with the reporter that I became because she had, um, she just, she gave me so much support. Any question that I had, I was able to reach out to her and ask her and she proofread every single transcript for the first six months as a working reporter, every single transcript. I mean, it was to her benefit because the transcripts were going out under her name, but I thought coming out of school that I knew exactly how to produce a transcript, right? Past school, I graduated, but uh, once I had somebody else proofreading my transcripts about how people talk in the real world, it was enlightening. And so I am just so grateful that she made that phone call and came looking for me. And I had the best first four years of a reporting career that anybody could have ever asked for. And by the time I left Chicago and moved to Arizona, uh, she probably had seven or eight reporters. I mean, her business really grew and we were just a small team. And that being said, I've always worked for small firms and I've never worked for any of the larger firms as a captioner. I've never been an employee at the large houses. That's just who I am. I like the smaller feel. I like the more one-on-one -on -one and the more personal relationships. Um, so I worked in Chicago for four years. I did not do real time when I was in Chicago. Um, but, uh, as, why, why is that? Why did you not want to do real time yet? It wasn't that I didn't want to. Well, I guess I need to put myself in those shoes. Of course, I didn't want to. I was scared to death. I was still a baby reporter in those first four years. Uh, I was doing real time for myself at the end. And I remember the first deposition that I took my computer with me and set it up and connected. I couldn't even, I couldn't even raise the screen couldn't even look at my own writing. I was trembling so bad just knowing that I was connected. But by the end of that deposition, like 20 minutes into it, I'd raise it up a little bit. 20 minutes more, I'd raise it up a little bit. By the end of that deposition, my screen was fully open and I was actually able to watch myself write. And I was like, well, this is kind of cool. But I just had to get over that fear. I wasn't ready to output to attorneys yet though at that point. And then I moved to Arizona. And Arizona was not a licensed state. So the fact that I had my RPR and that I was licensed in Illinois was definitely a plus uh, when I was looking for a firm to work with here in Arizona. And so I came here, I started doing a lot of hearings and the firm that I worked for had a contract with bankruptcy court. Now I did do court work in Chicago as a freelancer because in Chicago, uh, attorneys would bring in their court reporters from the outside because there weren't enough officials. So I did go to court, I did do motions, I did do trials, I did do daily copy trials. Um, but when I moved to Arizona, unless, we, um, unless you were an official, you really weren't in court. Bankruptcy court was kind of the exception to the rule. And needless to say, I didn't know diddly squat about bankruptcy. And that was terrifying. It was terrifying. 
because A, I was in a new place, so I had new cities, new things to learn, um, had to learn my way around, where to park when I got to bankruptcy court, but also just having 20 lawyers come in and say their name in rapid fire and who they represent, and it was baptism by fire that I wouldn't recommend for anybody, but um, that's what I did for about probably the first six months or so. I didn't like it. I will tell you, I did not like bankruptcy court. Um, before you go on, I just want to point out to everybody, if you're watching the captions, yes, indeed, she did write diddly squat. <laughs> so you need to have those kind of things in your dictionary. <laughs> Put anything in your dictionary. You never know what somebody is going to say, uh, as proven here by the word diddly squat. <laughs> And I'm so sorry I didn't even think about that as it just rolled off my tongue. Well, Tara's a great captioner. She had it there. And um, so, but I'm glad, I'm glad actually, because uh, they will say things like diddly squat. They will say things like, I don't know, I can't even think, but really random, funny things. So, all right. So your caption, I mean, you're reporting in, um, in Arizona. At some point, you decide to transition to captioning. Now, when you first did that, did you do both at the same time? I did. Um, I had always wanted in the back of my mind to be a captioner. I just didn't know where to get the training or how to make that transition. Back in 2003, there weren't a lot of training programs. And so I had the opportunity to attend a training program with some federal grant money. And that was fall of 2003. I finished that program. It was like going back to school all over again. I had to tweak my writing. And bear in mind, by that time, I was doing real time. I was doing a lot of real time. I was what they call a heavy hitter at my reporting firm, meaning I had three scopists, two proofreaders, and doing real time and a lot of the big jobs. So I was working a lot and I was making a lot of money, but I was also burning myself and I was burning myself out and I was getting very tired. So when this opportunity came up to actually get trained to do captioning, I jumped on it. And in 2004 was my transition year where I stopped working full time for the firm that I was with. And I said, I will work or with you on a overflow basis, which is what we call it here in Arizona, where you work for multiple firms. And I put cart captioning jobs as a priority. So as those came up, those were my priority. Um, I was also building a house at that time. I was, I sold my house and was building another house. So again, a lot of things going on in my life, kind of like when I graduated court reporting school, when I was getting married and moving and, and transitioning. I seemed to take on a lot of things all at one time. So that was 2004, and I did both reporting and cart captioning <clears throat> while I looked for a captioning job. All I ever wanted to do was caption television. Mm -hmm. That was truly um, why I wanted to be a captioner. I wanted to sit at home. I didn't want to do transcripts anymore, and I wanted to do broadcast captioning. I found a company that was really committed to providing quality captions in 2005, and they were willing to give me some even additional training and then put me on air and give me a part-time job or a part-time schedule. So I started captioning nights and weekends with them in 2005. I went on air in February. And then I did broadcast work for about a year and a half, in addition to depositions. And then I got the opportunity to work in the high schools, received an email from the uh, disability resource group at my local high school. And they said they had a student who did not know sign language and needed services. He was a freshman in high school and they didn't know what to do and how to accommodate his hearing loss because he didn't know sign language. And the family had done their homework and they were advocating for cart captioning for him. Long story short, um, my friend and I started providing services for him five days a week that, that semester. 
And the very next school year, that school district had seven students that needed CART services. Yeah, so that was a lot. So we went on the hunt to find court reporters who were looking for a change. And I trained seven court reporters how to do CART over the summer so that we would be able to hit the ground running on the first day of school. That's great. And you've uh, been carting and captioning ever since? I've been carting and captioning ever since. I've graduated high school more times than I can count. <laughs> those seven students. Um, I can't tell you how many times I have been taught about the Civil War and uh, uh, everything about history. And But, you know, I wouldn't trade that experience for mm -hmm. the world. It was so gratifying to be with students as seventh graders and then to see them graduate high school. Oh, yeah, that does, does sound great. Um, I want to ask you now about your competitions. This is such a, I mean, this is where I met you uh, first, I think, even though we're, mm -hmm. we're, not, we're on the same side of the country. Uh, I believe I met you in Paris uh, at the competitions there in Interstino. Um, and then every one I've gone to since, I guess. <laughs> but uh, tell yeah. us about why you just started, what, what your first competition was and how you decided to start competing and, and why. My first competition was actually at the NCRA convention here in Phoenix. And I can't remember when exactly that was. I can tell you in a minute. 2005. So, so you guys, she was, she, was just, she was just looking over at her wall of uh, many certificates and medals, I'm sure, when she <laughs> answered that question. <laughs> actually, I had to look at my resume because I couldn't remember what year that was. Um, but yeah, because I can remember it like it was yesterday, but I couldn't tell you what year it was. So that was 2005. So that would have been the year that I started doing broadcast work. And <clears throat> I started competing because, A, it was in my hometown. And I thought, if I'm ever going to do it, I'll just do it when it's in my hometown. I don't have to travel with my equipment. And um, I did not do the speed. I only did the real-time competition. Speed was never my game, as I'll put it. Um, I never felt that I was a super fast writer, so I only did real time for a long time. The first speed competition I did, Laura, I think actually was Budapest, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so the reason I started competing was because I was curious to see where my skill was compared to everybody else. I had a lot of certifications already at that point, but I just wanted to know where I stood um, amongst all the people who sat in that room. So it was really just a personal curiosity for me. And it was a great competition. And I was like, well, that's exciting. And it's really exciting to see how well you do. <clears throat> And I wouldn't say that I got the bug because I've not competed in every single competition since then. Um, I do it when I'm going to convention. Uh, I have been at all of the Interstenos, except I missed Belgium in 2013 because I had a big job that I just couldn't give up before I went there. So that's why I compete. I compete because I've passed all the certifications at that at this point in my career. And... I still want to test myself so that I know <clears throat> where I stand and because every day is a learning process and every day we can improve. How do you prepare for these competitions? Um, <clears throat> if I'm really serious about it, <laughs> I do practice. I, I listen to old uh, dictation. And I will tell you, the older dictation that you can find out there is really hard and really fast. And it's amazing to listen to old speed competitions and know that people were just passing those with flying colors because I listen to them and I'm blown away. So I listen to really fast dictation. I listen to really hard dictation. Um, prior to... Uh, 
Italy, I was listening to dictation that seriously wanted to make me cry. And I went, this is impossible. I can't do this. But you know what? Even though I said that, it was pushing me and it was making me better. I felt defeated, but it was making me better. And she placed. So just a little uh, lesson for all of you. When you were practicing and you feel like you're writing like crap and you're not getting anywhere, you are. Let me add um, one thing that is huge for me. And um, I would love to see students doing it more is learning how to breathe and learning how to focus. I mean, test anxiety is a thing. It's real. I haven't met anybody that doesn't get the jitters before a competition or a test. And I'm the same way. I get nervous. I have been practicing how to focus my breathing and tune out the noise. So it's meditation and turning off the noise in your head is a skill. It doesn't come easily, but it's what I do. That part of my practice when I get ready to compete is I start meditating. I start going to yoga. I start teaching myself and practicing how to sit and think about nothing. Because when you write the best, honestly, is when your brain is not focusing on other things. If you can get to that place where you hear words and your fingers naturally react, and at the end of that five minutes or 10 minutes, whatever it is, you have no idea what just happened, you're gonna have a beautiful paper. <laughs> I, I actually had somebody ask me once, what do you think about when you're writing? And we were practicing together and I looked at her and I said, you know what? In the last five minutes, I can't tell you what I was thinking about. I was in the zone on that particular day. That was also six years ago. That was in Paris. Come to think of it, Laura. Uh -huh. I want to just mention something here as I was listening to you talk um, is a lot of these people are students here on the call and people who are going to listen to it afterwards. And um, I want to just tell you something I saw Jen do at the competition. She walked around the tables of all the people near us before the, before the contest started. And she said, I think she shook her hand, shook everybody's hand and said, uh, you know, good luck and, you know, have fun. And I saw her with her big old smile walking around. Um, doing that and it made me think of how we can be very competitive in a bad way even at school like uh, being mad because people pass you up or um, feeling superior because you pass somebody up uh, I am gonna take that image of Jen walking around this competition in Italy um, telling everybody good luck and meaning it you could tell she really meant it she was exuding this beautiful <laughs> you know, energy. So I just wanted to mention that because I was thinking about that as she was talking about getting in her zone and <laughs> et cetera. Thank you, Laura. See, that's not something that, um, I didn't think twice about that because really <laughs> it's, at least at Interstino, and it should be this way everywhere, even when you're in school, I realized online schools, it might be difficult to build that camaraderie, but we each have our own journey but we need to support each other. And in a competition setting, it's fun. It should be fun. And Laura, like you said, you know, we're competitive. If we weren't competitive, we wouldn't compete in the first place. Um, but take the positivity of the experience and use that. And use that to say, um, you know, I can do this and build yourself up and build up the people around you. And that just makes the energy in the room that much, that much better. And it'll be a better experience for everybody. But really this, this training to become a court reporter is hard. It's difficult. And, and some people get through it faster than others. We each have our own path to take. Uh, I thought I knew exactly what I wanted to do when I went to court reporting school in terms of I wanted to be a court reporter. I loved walking into deposition rooms with high profile attorneys and setting up, you know, laptops and 
um, doing real time once I got to that point in my career. I loved putting on that power suit. And then I got to the point where I wanted to start captioning. And all I ever wanted to do was broadcast. And you know what? I loved doing the television captioning when I did it. And then I got this other opportunity to start doing CART. And here today, I'd say 90% of my work is doing the CART captioning. And probably 50% of that is on site. I never wanted to drag my equipment all over town or all over a college campus or frankly all over the world. And that's exactly what I do today. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. I love it. Great. That's great. Uh, I, uh, you have all have been hearing her, her story now. Um, now is the time you get to ask questions. Uh, please, please ask questions. You, you can, I'm sure you've absorbed so much from her already. Um, but questions would be good here. And you can unmute yourself if you like and ask a question or you can type it in the chat box. Either way. I'd love to hear voice. I know a lot of questions I, I get and, and people who are who, whom I interview get is, um, you know, how to practice, what kind of practicing you're doing. I know you mentioned just doing speed contests, but do you just listen to them over and over? Or is there any special way you practice things? I do listen to them over and over. It depends on what I'm practicing. So if I'm practicing for speed, I listen to uh, dictation that's significantly faster than I can write. I, and I repeat it over and over again, but then I will find dictation that is slower and go back and do some control so that I end on a positive note. You always want to end your practice time on a positive note where you're, you feel good and then you can walk away. You don't want to leave to, um, your practice session with feeling deflated and um, you want to leave on a good note so that you'll be motivated to come back again. Um, if I'm practicing for real time, then I find dictation that pushes me but is not so ridiculously fast that I can't obtain it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I slow that down. I do takes that might be 30 minutes in length to build up my endurance because if your test is only five minutes, you need to be able to write for 10. Mm -hmm. Because if you can write for 10 and <clears throat> not think anything of it, then when you write for five minutes, it's over in an instant. Yeah, yeah, true. Okay, here's another question. Um, Sandra says she's been looking into <clears throat> access services at universities in her area and use cprint what's your attitude impression experience with cprint so cprint is another type of accommodation for students with hearing loss <clears throat> it is a method i'm sorry a meaning for meaning method so what that means is that somebody will type on their uh, regular keyboard and they'll use macros so there is some shortcuts but they are if you are a typist a C print typist sometimes they call them C print captionists um, you will sit in the classroom with your laptop there is a program and there is a training for it and I forget how long it is it might be like six to eight weeks maybe a little longer it's been a while since I've looked into that but um, you would go in and you would take notes for a student and it would be meaning for meaning. So they're more comprehensive, obviously, than if you were writing by longhand, but they are going to be less comprehensive than if you were to have a cart captioner in that classroom. And it is the right accommodation for some students depending on their level of hearing loss. And another question here, do you keep in contact with some of your cart students? I do. I do. And um, one of the students that we worked with starting in seventh grade that we worked with him through high school and when he graduated, he then went on to some other colleges 
he now has not only his bachelor's, but he has his master's in public health, and he has just circled back to Phoenix, and now he's going to med school here locally. And so the same captioner that worked with him in seventh grade is now getting to sit next to him as he goes through med school. And we just knew this kid was going to be something, and uh, he is proving us right. But I do keep in touch with my students. I'm in, um, friends on Facebook with them, and um, it's just been really cool to see them grow up and be adults and move on and see the great things that they're doing. Yeah, it sounds, sounds really amazing. I mean, I, I, I'm not too proud to admit that I cried when they, mm-hmm. when they cried. Yes, yes, yeah. I, can, I can see that. Yeah. Uh, is it realistic for a student to do CART or captioning right out of school? Um, I think nowadays it is. You're going to need some additional training though once you finish court reporting school you're going to need that um, specialized training of captioning because there are some things that you will definitely need to tweak because you've been going through a verbatim program there's going to be a lot of dictionary stuff that you're going to need to tweak and make it so that it works for captioning but there is definitely a growing population of students now that are never becoming reporters and going straight into captioning Um, but you will need additional training uh, before you go on air or start doing um, classwork or any card captioning work how does CART pay compare with reporting pay? I'd say that's probably one of the most often asked questions. What I can tell you is that as a captioner, I did not take a reduction in pay compared to when I was a court reporter. Um, remember when I said I was a heavy hitter at my court reporting firm and I was doing very well? And then I transitioned and I did both for a little while, which is probably why my income stayed at the level that it did. And then um, as I started doing more cart work, I was very selective about who I worked for. I only wanted to work for companies that had a great reputation that were committed to producing quality captions. And even though I wanted to do this job so badly, Uh, I turned down a couple of job opportunities to be an employee because the pay wasn't where I needed it to be. Just financially, it was not where I needed it to be. And um, I got connected with firms that paid well because they were committed to quality. And one other thing of note that I will tell you is every single job and every single opportunity that I have had in my career has been a result of networking. Not one has been the result of me sending a resume. Good, good, good to know. That's really good to know. Yeah. Okay, two more questions I'll take here. Uh, One is what subject do you feel is the hardest to caption in, in general terms? Well, for me personally, I, I, I avoid things like art history. I'm not an artsy person. It's not, my area of interest. So that makes it really difficult for me. Um, Some people would say that medical is very difficult for them. I love medical. To me, medical is, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm happy to do it because I did mostly medical malpractice as a court reporter and that interests me. Um, Things as a captioner, I've never done a um, NASCAR race not interested in doing a NASCAR race, not interested in doing hockey. Um, I did hockey. I've done some hockey. (laughs) And uh, about math, do you do math classes? I do do math classes, and math classes are a challenge in their own way. Um, Tara actually reminded me of something that I have captioned, and I have captioned some lectures of some Holocaust survivors Mm -hmm. and that was really difficult, really difficult in just terms of the content and their experiences, but also in terms of the terminology, the names and um, their accents were also really difficult. So um, yeah, so there's a hard, in the 
aspect of terminology, and then there's hard in terms of emotionally being able to caption certain okay. things. Yeah. Two, the two last questions, I know I said that before, but these are the two last questions. Uh, what do you think about newly discussed 200 word per minute certs, as opposed to, I guess, 225 to get reporters out and working? And then the last thing is, what advice would you give to a new reporter? Um, well, let me take this first one first. I was going to say the second one because I'm looking in the chat. I had not heard about uh, the potential for a 200 word per minute certification to get reporters out working. Um, I don't know. I would have to give that some thought. Is it 200 words per minute for voice or is it 200 words per minute to voice? I know that Washington State, I believe, I believe their certification is only 180 words per minute. Um, so I would have to give that some thought. But here's what I can tell you is that however fast you write, it's never going to be fast enough on certain days. And so keep always improving your skill. And what advice would I give to a new reporter? I guess that would probably be it is we have our really good days. We have our really good days. We have our really bad days. And we have days where it seems like we've never written on the steno machine before. So keep practicing, keep in, um, improving your skill every day, keep learning. There is always something new to learn in this field. The technology is constantly changing. Um, don't let yourself just get stuck into a status quo, which can happen when you start working because there's so much work out there that you just keep working. But don't forget to uh, just keep improving your skills and being the best that you can be. Great. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, this has um, been really, really fun talking to you, getting to know you better through this. I know I see you here and there and we talk, but uh, this has been great. And I know everybody on the call has enjoyed it and there's going to be more people watching it and listening to it. So don't be surprised if you get some more questions emailed or texted to you or whatever. So um, I was just going to say, uh, we could talk for hours, and so feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer any questions at any time. My email is jen at captionpros.net. And um, the last thing that I will just say is network, go to conventions, um, talk to people, because that's where your, your doors of opportunity will definitely open. And also you learn a lot of stuff, and you pick up uh, – uh, some so much information just from being there and walking around. <laughs> I learn more information sitting next to other writers, sitting next to captioners, the way they write, the way they edit, the way they do things that I would never learn anywhere else. So that's just part of that, you know, empower each other and learn from each other. Yes, yes, great. Yes, true. Well, thank you also to Tara for this great captioning. I hope you all were uh, watching some of it because she's great. She's amazing. Um, and she can write diddly spots. So, you know, what, what more do you want from, some, from a captioner? <laughs> so, great. All right. Well, Jen, thank, yes, you, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing what you're going to do next as far as competing. How many more medals you're going to pick up? <laughs> Well, I am not going to Denver. I will not be competing in Denver. And so uh, I think I'm going to go back and focus on my clients and my consumers uh, for the time being and, and get my warm and fuzzies. Yes, that way. That's great. All right. So. Thank you. And we will see you again. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Indeed. Thanks, Laura.